Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm your host, Matt Wilson, and today we are here with Ben Collier. Ben is the general manager at Incredible Adventures. He's been working in adventure travel for almost 10 years, has spent five years as a guide in the United States, and is responsible for helping design our trips at under 30 experiences uh, in the United States, in these national parks that we're visiting, and uh, is really an expert and has been an amazing resource for us at under 30 uh, to really have uh, local knowledge and expertise uh, all about, you know, all over the United States, uh, but specifically out west where some of these national parks are beyond the scope of things I have explored uh, personally. And so it's been a pleasure working with Ben so far. So I wanted to bring him on the podcast and talk a little bit more about U.S. national parks, things that are really trending right now as we're recording this. It's covid 19, uh, the new normal, I guess. Uh, we're still amidst the pandemic here, but things are opening up, uh, mainly open as I just got back from a road trip um, all throughout the United States. I think I drove through 17 states or something like that and uh, yeah, hit six national parks and it was a really great experience. Uh, everything was open, everything went really well according to plan no hangups, uh, outdoors are a great place to socially distance and um, yeah, stay safe. So I want to talk to Ben about all of that and uh, get his take on, on the great outdoors and how we can explore our own backyard. So without further ado, Ben, welcome. Hey, Matt, thanks for having me on. Of course, of course, you're, you're very welcome. And uh, Ben, I wanted to start off and just kind of get your story a little bit more about how you came to work in an exciting industry like adventure travel. I know just from speaking with you, and we've had several uh, long conversations about the outdoors is something that you're very passionate about. And you have quite a bit of knowledge. I mean, you, you've told me, uh, you know, <laughs> Along my road trip, even, I was pinging you and asking you, hey, where should I go here in Jackson, Wyoming? And you would give a, a whole list of uh, hikes and places uh, that I should go and check out. So excited to pick your brain this time in a recorded session for people to hear uh, on the podcast. But um, Ben, how did you get to come to work uh, in adventure travel? This is something that I've never asked you. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, kind of fell into it, um, but I do feel really lucky to be able to work in, uh, you know, a profession that I'm really passionate about. So I graduated university and then um, moved to Portland, Oregon uh, with some friends, just didn't really know what I was going to do with my life. And I was working in the hotel industry, um, just, I don't know, kind of service jobs um, for a few years. And then eventually basically got sick of that. Um, and at the same time while I was working, you know, I was doing lots of day trips and, and Portland, Oregon is fantastic for that. So kind of just carving out any time I could to go camping, go hiking, you know, just be outdoors um, and, and explore the city. And I just basically sort of burnt out of the service industry uh, or that side of the service industry. Um, it was a high, I was working at a really high end luxury hotel. Um, and I decided to switch things up. I took a long road trip. Um, through the Southwest, went to Zion National Park, uh, Bryce Canyon, um, Moab, a handful of, you know, kind of destinations that we've spoken about, Matt, um, and just kind of opened my eyes and said, you know, I said, I want to do this for a living somehow. Um, and basically just started applying to guide jobs. Um, fell into a, a basically adventure travel guide job um, where we would lead um, uh, groups of up to 13 people, um, multi-day trips through national parks, camping, um, sort of the same sort of thing that under 30 experiences trying, you know, is doing with their current trips um, and really fell in love with it. And I did it for five years straight um, where I didn't have an apartment or a house. I was just constantly on the move guiding for different companies. Um, I led trips throughout all the U.S. Um, and Canada, Alaska and Hawaii, um, and um, yeah, just really fell in love with traveling um, and traveling in the U.S. specifically. Um, during my, you know, if I took time off, I would head, I would head abroad. Um, I've traveled throughout Europe and Asia and Africa and 
and got plenty of international travel under my belt, but I always really enjoyed traveling the U.S. because I think it's pretty eye-opening to see, um, you know, what, what the neighbors are like and, and what areas, you know, are special about this country. So it's something I really ended up enjoying. And then after about five years of guiding, I, I did move into um, an operations role at a, at a different company um, and still would get out and guide once in a while. I actually guided a trip in, in February. Um, so about one a year now, um, but I've been kind of an office guy now for about five years, um, but it's still fun as I get to talk about travel all the time. That's, that's awesome. And, uh, well, I know the feeling nobody yeah. has put it as an office guy, but, uh, I guess you're, <laughs> here we are, yeah. um, but you know, it provides, a, uh, platforms, not the right word. Um, yeah, pro provides us the means to be able to go out and do these things on our, yep. on our off time. Um, ben, you, I wanted to back up uh, to a place that's hot on a lot of, uh, at least hot in the news, and that is Portland, Oregon. Now, um, to frame this for everybody, uh, again, we're talking during COVID, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, some civil unrest, and not so much currently as, as we're speaking, we're, we're talking in October, right? Um, perhaps in Portland, as I, I haven't really been following it too much, I didn't know that we would get into this on the, yeah, sure. uh, on the con in this conversation, but my point is that a lot of us want to, we want, everybody's trying to get out of these cities, right? Um, whether it's New York or LA or San Francisco or, or who, it doesn't have to be one of the major cities, even I, I just left Austin. People are trying to get out and see things outside. We're trying to socially distance. And of course, yeah, uh, people are a little bit more worried about uh, civil unrest within the city. So uh, I would love to know if Portland would be a place that you would consider uh, flying into or, or driving into an even safer option um, and then going and exploring places, I don't know, Mount Hood or Bend or these are just a few of the places that I know. I don't know much about Oregon, but would you still take that trip uh, at this time? Absolutely. Um, and I would love to, honestly. <laughs> That'd be really great right now. Um, yeah, I mean, the and I also love exploring American cities too. I mean, now is not a great time, you know, obviously for, for COVID reasons, but um, I live in downtown Oakland um, and we've had a, a fair amount of civil unrest here, um, like really just outside my door. Um, and I mean, it's, it's, it's not pleasant, um, but it, it wouldn't stop me from traveling. I mean, it's not, it's not dangerous, you know, to go to Portland, Oregon right now. Um, and I think it's a fantastic jump off place to go explore outdoor areas and, and especially up there because it's, it's a lot of national forest land and, and areas that are less traveled to. Um, I mean, I think that'd be a great choice for a trip. Um, and, and Portland's a big city and I'm sure, you know, as much as we want to avoid cities right now, there's lots of areas that you can still enjoy even with, you know, what the, the unrest that's going on in the downtown area. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good to know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've been to Portland once, and really, that was my itinerary. I flew into Portland for a conference. Yeah. Um, hit a bunch of you know the coffee shops and stuff what downtown that Port yeah. Portland's so known for. Now I would be more cautious unless I could sit outside. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, then going, I, I went up to Mount Hood. I stayed in that Timberline Lodge. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, that was. Yeah, it was, it was great. It was on a whim and um, then drove down for some, maybe a state park or state forest. I think on the way uh, to, uh, to Mount Hood and then came back down the other side. Okay. I think that side is Bend. I, I, I would need a map. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, the, yeah. The hood, that's the Hood River? Yeah, Hood River and um, yeah, Hood River would be, I guess, northeast of Mount Hood and then Bend is just um, almost directly east. Yeah, okay. it gets cold out there. Um, that's a great area too. Nice. If somebody wanted to go on that trip, any anything you might suggest out there specifically? Out east of the Cascades, yeah. Um, I mean, if you if you can make it down to Crater Lake National Park, that's just fantastic, and not as as heavily visited as, as many of the other ones on the West Coast. 
Uh, it's the deepest lake in the U.S. Um, and it's the only lake that I've, I've been to it a couple times. It's the only lake that I've been to where you, you're not, you know, usually you look out on a lake. This one, you're really like looking into it. It's, it's really crazy because you're up on top of a caldera. So the, the lake is basically fenced in by this, by, in a crater. And it's really big and bright blue. Um, and you just kind of peer down to it and it looks, I mean, it feels really silent. I don't know, it's, it's a really special feeling. Um, wow. It's a great park. Um, you know, and, and maybe try to get out on one of the rivers. Like the Deschutes River goes through Bend. Great for rafting if, you're into, if, you, if you like to fish, fly fishing. Um, yeah, and the weather is great in that side. I mean, we think of Oregon as really rainy. And it, and it is on the Portland side and the west side, but once you get out towards Bend and east of the Cascades, you're getting probably almost 300 days of sunshine every, every year. And yeah, it's fantastic. Great views of the volcanoes. Wow, that, yeah. that's awesome. So as an East Coaster and then mm -hmm. someone who lived uh, in Texas, right? Uh, sure. I don't think too much about volcanoes in the yeah. United States other than Hawaii, right? And, yeah. and I lived in Costa Rica for so long that sure there are dozens of active volcanoes in Costa Rica and that's something that I thought about a lot I lived on the Pacific Ocean it's the ring of fire etc um, but I didn't I don't think so much about them in the United States for whatever reason uh, but I need to to mention that uh, a place that you hooked me up with uh, Yellowstone right where you gave me a lot of good tips up there that caldera is enormous and apparently 360,000 years ago it shot massive I don't know right call them rocks but like mm -hmm. huge pieces of earth all the way to Texas is oh, what yeah. I read when I was up there that was just mind-blowing mm -hmm. yeah it's like I mean borderline an extinction level event right I mean huge huge eruption um, and it's kind of fun to think you can go camping on it now <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, um, yeah, that, that was fascinating. Um, so where else, uh, okay, so if you had a blank slate, and we'll keep this topical for people because it's October right now, uh, winter is coming, but I think people are still trying to sneak out in the fall uh, as best they can before it gets too cold. Um, and if people could go, let's say, anywhere in the United States, in the fall, uh, where, where might you send them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I'd say if you're east of the Mississippi, New England, um, and I, I'm from New England. Uh, I know you're from the Northeast as well. Um, and I still love um, October. New England is one of my favorite situations. You know, I'm, I'm actually going to visit my, my folks in New Hampshire in a couple of weeks. Um, I think I'll miss all the, the leaf changes, but it'll still be great to get out there. So, you know, Maine, um, Vermont, New Hampshire, those areas. If you're, if you're out west, um, I like uh, the Eastern Sierra Mountains. So if you think of Yosemite National Park, we're on the west side of, of the chain. If you cross over the mountains on the east side, again, it's a little bit drier. Um, you get some great foliage. Uh, the weather is really clear and a little bit crisper. Um, and, and maybe up in, in Utah too, like um, Zion and, and uh, Bryce, those areas, a little bit higher elevation, you get great color changes and the weather gets really good. It's not so hot. Um, those would be kind of my, my picks. This, you know, you gotta get be somewhat south at a certain point or it's gonna get too cold. Um, Right, and we're we're oh, talking, man. right, this might come out in a week or so. So we're talking, people are going to listen to this, start listening October 15th. So, yeah, you should consider some sub, more southern locations. As you said, you might miss New England. I, I had the opportunity to see some of the stuff in September that changed. So starting with Park City, Utah, and then... Uh, up into to Wyoming, Yellowstone, made it up to um, Big Sky, Montana, nice. over to Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota, which was a real cool sleeper. That was like a little icing on the cake for the trip because once we started driving east, we thought, oh God, we got to drive through, apologies to any Midwesterners, but all the flyover states, right? I will, oh geez, this is going to be real boring. Um, but North Dakota, that was, that was awesome. I, I really, have you been, Ben? Yeah, I have actually. Um, North Dakota was 
my fifth, no, it wasn't my 50th state. I've been to all 50 states. Um, it was like my 49th state or something like that. It was my 50th. Nice. Good for you. Yeah. It's a great milestone, isn't it? Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And that's, I had to do, I had been to South Dakota twice. Mm -hmm. And so we were in Montana. I was like, all right, I got to make this happen or else when, when else do you have the opportunity to get to North Dakota? Um, I, mean, I think North Dakota is the la like one of the last states for most people. And it's a little overlooked, but I, I, it's a fantastic place. Yeah. I mean, the wild, we saw more wildlife there than probably all the other national parks right. combined, including Yellowstone. Right. Now we weren't in Yellowstone for a long time, but I mean, we saw bison, those pronghorn, which are like oh, yeah, antelope, nice. um, yeah. the wild horses, the uh, the prairie dogs, like some unique stuff too that I yeah. had never seen before. So yeah, I love seeing pronghorns. They're pretty. They're pretty cool. Yeah. It, uh, so they have. Uh, God, I, I'm not a country music person, but um, Home on the Range. There yeah. is a city in North Dakota, apparently. Oh, I saw a sign for it on the exit that was just called Home on the Range. And uh, R Roy Rogers, I think that's who sings that song. I, I had, of course, look it up. And then they also, I had it like stuck in my head, but probably hadn't heard the song in 20 years. So they have, uh, <laughs> they say where the deer and the antelope roam. Mm -hmm. And I asked my wife and I was like, other antelope in North America. What's what's the issue? Like, no, I'm pretty sure that's Africa, obviously, right? But then we looked into it a little bit more, and from a quick, these are quick Google searches. But yeah. the pronghorns are what look like antelope. I don't even think they're from the same family, but yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. They're still they're cool regardless. And I think people don't know about them, and then you get out west and you see them, and they're they're super fast too. I think they're the second fastest animal on the planet. Um, so if you get lucky enough to see him take off, like it's, it's pretty cool to watch that. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, it was, it was cool up there. Um, so Ben, if we are, all right, <clears throat> we covered kind of fall, obviously the main attraction is where it's still, um, well, I don't even know if I finished my point cause I got so excited about, uh, seeing the, the Northern States there, but you want to be a little bit South where, later in October into November, you'll still have some colors uh, if you're listening to this right now. So keep that in mind if you're thinking about travel. But then where, where in the winter might you go? Everybody thinks of ski trips. And um, I think it would be, we'll see what the protocols, safety protocols are this winter. But I think it would be fairly safe to go skiing. The lodges might be a little bit, uh, that's probably your highest risk when you're indoors um but yeah as long as you you could socially distance skiing pretty well don't be on the f four people on a chairlift uh etc um, reservation systems too at many ski areas oh okay yeah. okay do you know um some of the big ski like Vail resorts yeah, is that what they're doing yeah, they Vail, um, i guess i want to say don't quote me on this but we're on a podcast um <laughs> i i'm pretty sure Vail resorts is at least um but at a it's, it's a pretty complicated system, but um, uh, most resorts aren't selling, like free selling day, day tickets. Like you, you have to book in advance and there's, there's like a quota. So they're gonna try to keep, sure. yeah, which is probably, probably the right thing to do. Um, Cause I mean, skiing seems like a, a great, I mean, you got a mask on anyways and you're outside. Um, sure. Yeah, that's a fantastic activity. Okay, so, so we have yeah. skiing, um, but for non-skiers and snowboarders, where, where might you send people? Um, I always, I grew up going to South Florida. My grandparents lived in Key West for 30 years. We'd go to the, we'd fly into like Fort Lauderdale, Miami, hit the Everglades National Park, go down and see them, go fishing in Isle Morada, all that. Um, but outside of South Florida, where would you go in the wintertime? Yeah, and I mean, I, it's, most of this country is pretty cold in the winter, right? So South Florida right. is an exception. Um, so I would say either, I mean, you can go to Southern California, you can go to Hawaii, um, or you know, you can take advantage of the colder weather and go to some of the, the destinations that are really, really hot in the summer, right? So um, Death Valley is a fantastic national park. Joshua Tree is another fantastic national park, both in the desert and probably too, too hot midsummer to really enjoy. Um, I mean, especially Death Valley, I think it, if, if it didn't set another record this summer, it came close. Um, and in the winter, it's, you might get some warm days. It's probably not gonna be 
you know, beach weather like South Florida, but it's tolerable. And um, so taking advantage of the, of the cold weather to explore some of the parks that are too hot in this, in the summer um, would be good. And I also think like it can be, uh, you know, it's, it's a good experience to kind of lean into the winter and maybe go to a, you know, a, a cold destination like, like Yellowstone in the winter is, is pretty magical. I mean, there's not going to be anyone there. Um, it's great wildlife. Um, they close most of the roads, which makes it a little bit lo more logistically challenging, but um, there's some great options on how to enjoy the park in the winter. Yosemite, you know, which is, is sort of my backyard here. Um, I mean, seeing giant sequoia trees in, in snow is, is spectacular, you know? So, I, and, and basically any national park is going to be less busy. Um, so uh, you have a lot of options, um, but if you're trying to stay, you know, away from the cold, yeah, I think um, some of those desert parks or of course, Hawaii. I mean, we all love Hawaii. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, do you know what's going on ho with Hawaii? Again, we won't quote you and any listeners can, can go and uh, look this up on your own. Don't listen to, don't listen yeah. to us or don't no, take it no, what no, we're no. saying as, don't book your flights after listening to this, at least do some verification here. But is it still a mandatory 14 day quarantine? I believe so. I'm, I think they've opened it up. If you arrive with um, negative test results, you can okay. get it. You can pass it. So they've, the last time I checked, at least, they had loosened it a little bit. Um, okay, yeah, that's that's great. Um, ben, for people wondering, okay, how do I go and get a COVID test? I want to go to, um, let's see, Maine, uh, Rhode Island it is actually a state uh, that has a COVID uh, test requirement right now. Um, as you said, Hawaii, and uh, this could all change in the future, but where, where would you go to get your COVID test? Because it has to be within 72 hours. Is that right? Yes. Some of the states. Um, yeah. And, and it seems like, I mean, the impression I get is that testing is, is widely available. I mean, we, we've been operating this summer, we've been operating tours uh, with, with lots of safety protocols and with, um, you know, reduced capacity in all our vehicles. Um, and we've been getting frequent tests for our employees. Um, and, you know, in San Francisco, for instance, we, um, we have a big drive through parking lot right on, the, right in the port. And you basically drive through to get your test and you get results right to your phone within a, a two days usually. Um, and we've had similar success out east um, where it's been a pretty quick turnaround. Um, outside of the Bay Area, when I've looked for testing um, for, for our staff members, um, it's just been a quick Google search and it seems like there's lots of research or resources there. Um, so I think we've come a long way with testing and that's made it a lot easier for us to get out and enjoy traveling a little bit. That, that's great. Yeah, I know. Uh, in the beginning, if you had a little scratchy throat or something and you went for a test, it could have been five to seven days. You should be quarantining anyway during a pandemic if you're not feeling well, uh, mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter if you, if you got tested and it, it, they come in five to seven days, well, then it doesn't even really matter. Um, yeah. Yeah. But if you get it in, in two days time, okay, that's going to be worth something. Um, mm -hmm. So, and if for anybody who has, uh, is watching the video and has seen me typing away here, I'm taking uh, copious notes so that we can link all this up on the under 30 experiences blog, uh, the resources for people. So, and if they want a quick link uh, to get there, they can find that at millennialtravelpodcast.com. So uh, people can get the, the links to that. I just, did one through CVS Minute Care. It was the drive-through clinic, and um, I, you know, CVSs are everywhere, at least where I was at the time. And so I uh, did a I did a Google search or on their website, and they showed me each location and then how quickly they thought they could turn around. Some were almost in. I don't want to say instant, but we're within a few hours, um, which I thought was really impressive. Um, you know, I did the two days. I was, yeah, whatever. I, it came back negative. Um, yeah. I'm fine. But uh, yeah, so good, good resources uh, for people to have. I also have a good article that I'll link up because people can, if they don't even want to go out or leave their homes, which if you are symptomatic, that would be even the best, um, you can get this package overnighted to your house 
and then you can do the you know nasal nasal swab or whatever it is. Um, there's different kinds of tests, and then put it uh, yeah mail it back out, and they'll give you your tests uh, test results really quickly. And um, I'll preface all this, of course, the same. We're just trying to provide information here for people. Neither of us are doctors, and uh, yeah, do your own do your own research. Uh, don't hold us to any of this, but trying to get the best information out there um, because people are in the dark about this this kind of stuff. So, um, okay, Ben, to, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just know real quick that a lot of the testing is free too, um, which is which is great. Right. Yeah, so that's that's another worry that you know, something you don't have to worry about. Like if it was hundred dollars every time, but it's free, a lot of them are free, not all of them, um, but that's really helpful too. No, that, that's really good. Um, yeah, thank you for, for sharing that, uh, Ben. And so, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep moving. Actually, let's go back to winter here because there's two things uh, that you recommended for us and we're actually running them for under 30 experiences so maybe a bit of a shameless plug but some ideas that i had never thought of um you just mentioned you know joshua tree would be a really cool place to see uh and that you could still camp in not and maybe in the dead of winter and keep in mind everybody it gets cold at night in the desert uh but you mentioned to me, uh, Zion and Bryce Canyon and seeing that in the winter time. Uh, yeah, what, what's that like, Ben? Yeah, so it's actually, it, it's funny, that's the last tour that I, that I ran as a leader. Um, like I said, I, every once in a while I get out on the road and I, I did one in February um, where we went to Zion and Bryce, um, as well as the Grand Canyon. Um, and first of all, I mean, Zion National Park is one of the busiest national parks in the country. And the main part of the park is in a narrow canyon. So the crowds just be, almost get overwhelming in the middle, middle of the summer because everyone's kind of packed into one area. So going in the winter, first of all, you have none of that. And you basically get the place to yourself, which is just, to me, uh, it's priceless. Um, and then you get a little, you know, you still get pretty warm days in, in Zion. Um, the mornings might be around freezing and, and same thing at night, but, um, the sun comes up and you might get temperatures in the 60s, even 70s if you're lucky. Um, and uh, maybe a little bit of snow up on the higher peaks, which is pretty. Um, but I just really like going to Zion in the winter because there's no one there. And then Bryce is, you're gonna climb about another 4,000-ish feet, maybe a little bit more um, in elevation to get up to Bryce Canyon. So there you'll get a lot of snow. Um, and if anyone's seen pictures of Bryce or been to Bryce, it's, it's basically an amphitheater that you look down into with kind of crazy different rock formations that we call hoodoos and they're all bright orange um, kind of sticking out of the you know of the slope and you'll get tons of snow mixed in there in the winter and it just is a, a really great contrast super beautiful um, you also get some of the again it won't be very crowded um, and you get some of the clearest night skies in the country in Bryce as well um, so great stargazing if you can deal with the cold weather. Um, yeah, it's just a really special time. I mean, everyone's got photos of Bryce from the summer and has been to Bryce in the summer, but I, only a few of us get to go in the winter and, and see it with snow. I think that's really cool. Wow, that's that's awesome. And the hoodoos, I remember when I saw that on the itinerary, I needed to actually uh, give it a little Google to see what the heck a hoodoo was. I have not been to that area of the country. Yeah. That, that's funny. And um, then I wanted to ask you, uh, Ben, uh, another place that you brought up um, that I've taken a, a keen interest uh, in is uh, Lake Tahoe. And um, one of the reasons, one of the things that uh, popped up for me, so I recently wrote a, an article on my own blog uh, about how millennials are leaving cities and mm -hmm. they're looking to leave to not only just get out of the, the city and have more space, right, but also to avoid taxes in, in cities like California, uh, or cities, states like California. Um, and I would love to know 
a little bit more about the Tahoe region because it looks like it's significantly cheaper than the rest of Cal, not maybe not the rest of California, but San Francisco, uh, certainly. And that you could live, I think in South Lake Tahoe is, um, that's might be the Nevada or state line Nevada, I think is the Nevada side. I don't know if that would be a desirable place to live, but I've, <laughs> that idea popped up for me when I was like, okay, yeah, I could leave Austin, but where would I go? Um, or where would I just want to check out for a few months? Uh, now that we all have these remote work um, possibilities, you know, the world is a lot of people's oyster, or, or I should say uh, the United States, if you're already here. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of good places to go and check out. So I'd love to learn more about Tahoe. And of course, we're, we're running a trip there with under 30 yeah. experiences. Yeah, I mean, Tahoe's fantastic, right? I mean, you've got, you've, you've obviously in the winter, you've got great skiing, um, great winter sports. Um, and in the summer, you've got, again, great hiking and, and access to the lake. Um, and, you know, if you think of, think of the lake is broken up mainly into the north and the south. Um, the south lake side is definitely going to be a little bit more built up, um, has a little bit more kind of nightlife and, and restaurants and things like that, which, which is really great. Um, north is a little bit quieter, um, but you've got Truckee and, and Reno is also a little bit closer. Um, and then through the lake is the California-Nevada border. So uh, it's, it's pretty funny. As soon as you cross the border on either side, it's casino, casino, casino um, into Nevada. Um, and then, you know, regular towns too. So you do have the, the option of living in, in either state. Um, and... Um, yeah, it's a fantastic place to live. A little bit higher in elevation, but still lots of sunshine. I mean, even the winters there, you can get a ton of snow, um, which everyone in Tahoe is looking forward to getting more and more snow, um, but you get a lot of sunshine too. So it's not like you're, you're still in California, you know? Um, you still get a lot of sunshine and, and warm days even in the winter, um, despite the snow. Um, and I know, you know, another place that it seems like it's getting more and more popular is Reno, um, which is only 40 minutes from, from Lake Tahoe um, and is kind of an up and coming city, I think, and, and fast growing and, and much, much cheaper than the Bay Area. So I know a lot of, you know, tour guide type people have moved to Reno just because it's a cheaper alternative and it's got great access to the outdoors. Um, so that whole area is fantastic. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, Reno is somewhere that I'd like to to check out as well. Um, I re I recommended just uh, offhand Reno in that article, and I'll link again. I'll link people uh, up this article on the Under Thirty Experiences blog or Millennial Travel Podcast dot com in the the show notes. This one that I wrote on uh, my personal blog about millennials uh, fleeing cities. But, and so Reno was one place that I, I did think that was going to um, see an uptick. But uh, so it has a, a nice outdoor community. There's still cool stuff around. But is the city of Reno, I mean, the, the reputation of Reno, like I'm thinking Reno 911, right? That old show. I don't know if it's still running, but uh, it, the city is coming around now as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the downtown area is still very casino driven, um, but uh, Midtown Reno has got really neat kind of hipster coffee shops and bars and lots of art galleries and they've got great kind of events. Um, I've always had a great time visiting. Um, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely, um, there's areas that are still kind of getting redeveloped um, and, and it's still sort of low rent casino feel to it. Um, but the, like I said, the Midtown area is, is really cool. I used to go to, um, at this music festival every year. Uh, now I can't think of the name of it. I'll have to get back to you about it, but All right. uh, there's, there's great live music and, and things like that. Um, cool. as well. um, and then if you head, you know, from Tahoe or Reno, if you head East, then you just get into Northern Nevada. And I mean, there's tons of outdoor stuff that is pretty overlooked. Um, lots of hot springs, lots of great mountain ranges and hikes. I mean, it's one of my favorite like little facts, but Nevada has more 10,000 foot mountains than any other state besides Alaska. Like we think of it as kind of just open desert, but sure. it's more than that is filled with mountain ranges um, that are pretty unvisited. And um, yeah, it's really great to explore. Okay. And uh, 
Tim Gillespie is somebody on our uh, under 30 experiences team. And he just wrote an article actually about Nevada and uh, some hiking places to cool. check out. So uh, mm -hmm. I'll link yeah. that up in the show notes as well. And Ben, you mentioned Truckee. It's a famous, Truckee is California. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, it's a famous town, but I don't really know why. Uh, will you mm -hmm. fill me in why? <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's on the railroad. It's, it's just maybe... 15 20 minute drive from the lake but north so it's not on the lake like most of the communities um it's it's on the highway in the main railroad crossing um it might have um i'd be guessing but i think the history might be tied to the cold russian people crossing over we call it donner pass um right there uh by lake tahoe and that's um if you've heard of the donner party it's you know a famous story of of some pioneers heading to the gold rush, um, getting stuck and having to make some difficult decisions um, wow. in order to survive. Yeah. Um, so that area is, I guess, that's probably some of the historical significance, but I don't know too much about Truckee. I know it's a cool community for sure. Cool. Yeah, no, just a place that uh, if you've been around the outdoor community enough, it pops up. Oh, yeah, um, people talk about Truckee. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, that uh, place, uh, again, an area of the country that I'd love to, uh, to get to know and explore. So that's why I've been asking you so many questions uh, mm -hmm. about it. So I, I wanted to move in, Ben, a little bit more for people who are um, going out and camping and hiking and uh, maybe backpacking for the first time. We're seeing tons of people say, okay, well, I couldn't go to Italy or I couldn't, uh, I, people were gonna hike uh, El Camino de Santiago in, in Spain, uh, right, and, and goes to, I think, a couple other countries, or they were going to plan that trip to Machu Picchu or Patagonia or wherever, and now they're like, okay, I need to pivot a little bit here and do something in the United States. Um, so I was wondering if uh, we could start basic and if people were going out uh, hiking and they were going solo uh, or maybe just with one friend which is of course is more recommended than hiking solo um, could you give people maybe some some safety tips on uh, what would your safety talk look like uh, if you were if you were guiding but you were just sending people off in in the wilderness I think this is important to cover yeah absolutely so um, always like you said it's always best to hike in groups um, and um, so yeah, with, with a tour group, we'd, we'd absolutely make sure that people are hiking in groups, especially if we're in areas where you have, you know, if you're in what we call bear country, right? Just for safety's sake, always hiking groups. Um, if you're at home alone, you know, and you're going out on a hike by yourself, you know, not on a tour, just make sure you tell someone where you're going um, in case, you know, you're, you're not back on time. That way people know how to find you. Um, I think um, we always make sure that people have the appropriate amount of water. Um, it's alarming how many times you see people on some of these desert hiking trails with with nothing with no water um yeah i mean that, that's i think one of the big dangers it's so simple to avoid make sure you have you know depending on how the length of the hike you know a few liters of water um food especially if you're hiking in heat salty salty food salty snacks to get your electrolytes back up um and then uh Appropriate clothing, layers, um, avoid cotton when possible if it's a strenuous hike and, um, you know, pack layers because if you're, you know, if you're in the desert or you're in the mountains, the weather can change um, or if you're running late and the nights, you know, the sun starts to go down and it gets really cold, you want to be prepared for that. Um, we also have, you know, for, for group hikes, we always... We always try to get um, what we call a scout and sweep uh, system. So we, we designate someone to be in the front and someone to be in the back so that we, we have a kind of an accurate count of where everyone in the group is. Um, when we stop to, you know, nature calls and you have to duck into the woods, um, we would say pack on the trail. We want to make sure that we know that someone has left the trail so that we can wait for them. Um, just little simple things like that. I mean, hiking is, 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 you know, not an adrenaline, you know, sport. Um, it's, it's fairly easy to be safe, um, but it's, I think people sort of underestimate nature sometimes and they don't bring water or they don't dress appropriately. So we just like to hammer that in and make sure that everyone's prepared for a hike. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to 
turn your ankle real bad and uh, you're hiking in the evening and then all of a sudden you're looking at staying the night and nobody's going to pass you on the trail until morning um, or, you know, God forbid you fall and hit your head or there's, there's plenty that can go wrong. Um, but not, not to scare people, but yeah, just, just being prepared. But Ben, you said bears and that does scare people. Uh, you got black bears, you got brown bears, you got grizzly bears, probably in the ascending order of terror. <laughs> uh, you know, if you're in the great, if you're in the Great Smoky Mountains or the Shenandoahs, that's one thing. But if you're in Yellowstone, that's another. So could you walk us through uh, some bear safety tips, please? Yeah. I mean, first of all, there's, there's never really, pretty sure this is accurate, there's never been a bear attack of a, a, a group of four or more, right? So if you're in a group, like, immediately you're more safe. So in grizzly bear country, um, you know, people do what they want to do, but like, at least on my tours, I mean, really mandate that people are in, in groups. Um, and then you just want to be loud. Bears don't eat people. Um, they, you know, they don't, they're not looking to attack you. It, it's usually out of misunderstanding. So if you can let the bear know that you're there by, you know, chatting on the, on the trail and in some places in Alaska where there's a lot of grizzly bears, some of my friends will sing songs or we clap our hands and we say, hey bear, hey bear. Um, as we go around tight corners, because um, you just don't want to surprise a bear. Um, in in re like again in in sort of real wilderness areas in Alaska, you carry bear spray. Um, our guides in Yellowstone will carry bear spray. Um, never had to use it um, since I've been working, but um, just as a as a backup. Um, and in case you do see a bear, I mean the number one thing to do is never ever run. Um, because we always say, because food runs, right? I mean, that's going to trigger their, their instinct to chase you. Um, again, every time I've encountered a bear on the trail, they take off running in the opposite direction. They don't like to encounter people. Um, so you just be loud, you know, don't be aggressive, but be loud on the trail and make sure the bear knows where you're at. Um, and it, it's really easy to avoid um, any kind of incidents with bears. That's great. Yeah, when, when we were in, uh, I think it was Grand Teton, um, there were plenty of people around, so I wasn't too concerned uh, on this particular trail. I think this was Jenny Lake. Um, yep. But, you know, my wife was a little nervous, and we got a baby with us, and uh, I had an aluminum water bottle, and so I just picked up a stone, and just as we were going, just started tapping it against the water bottle, and, and it made it quite a lot of noise. It was like banging pots and pants together. But, you know, and you see uh, people with bear bells. Um, mm -hmm. I could link one up in the, the show notes so people see. Yeah. <laughs> ben, our under 30 experiences groups are now going to show up. <laughs> 10 well, people with bear yeah. bells and pots and pans. and. <laughs> but, it, hey, better than better to be safe than, than sorry. Um, you know, when I was hiking on this past trip, even we got up to, like, Big Sky and there was – you know, warnings about bears and everything and um there were two and a half of us hiking together my wife and i and baby so i made sure i brought bear spray and uh i did the water bottle trick and in more open areas i felt safe because i knew i wasn't going to sneak up on anybody um when you get around like you said around a corner or something then yeah make a little bit more noise and um yeah that's uh, and, and you made a good point also about uh, food run, so you don't want to turn your back to the bear and run away. Same with, with mountain lions, um, and even in uh, some national parks in Costa Rica, they have the same signs for jaguars. Yeah, yeah. Never happens. You know, jaguar hardly ever, 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 ever will stalk a human. But uh, if so, you don't want to show them the backside of your neck and be vulnerable. So. Um, Cool. Yeah, Ben, thanks for, for sharing that. And um, how about leave no trace uh, hiking and camping? I know this is something that we practice with under 30 experiences. People may see a sign that says leave no trace, but could you tell people what that really means? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it really just boils down to leaving things the same or better than when you got there. So um, some really simple rules to, to go by and, and leave no trace. I, I believe this website, you probably link it into the show notes as well. Um, you can get a free leave no trace certification. Um, just like you go through a little lesson and you get a test. And I think 
Um, anyone who wants to explore the outdoors, it's a good, good thing to check out. But some examples are, you know, don't take anything with you. Um, don't, you know, grab, when we go to Yosemite, there's all these great big pine cones laying on the ground and everyone wants to take one for a souvenir, but then there won't be any left for other people to enjoy. Um, so make sure you don't take things with you. Um, obviously don't leave anything behind. Um, you know, when we, we do our camp, when we take down camp on our trips, we also, before we get, before we take off, everyone does a quick sweep. We look for any of the little micro trash even that people might've dropped, little candy wrappers or, or things like that. Um, yeah, so the only thing you should take is, is um, photos. Um, and, and then, you know, be conscious of wildlife. Don't feed wildlife. Um, you see that happening a lot in, in national parks with things like squirrels or deer. Um, people want a great photo, so they try to feed the animal, but it's really disruptive for their behavior. Um, it can be really bad for their health. Um, and it, frankly, it can be sometimes dangerous. Um, another one of my like, favorite little facts is the number one um, cause of injury at the Grand Canyon is squirrel bites. From people squirrel trying to squirrel. Squirrel bites. And it's like, that is on a, that's avoidable. Um, oh so God. just, just being respectful of nature, um, a lot of it's common sense. Um, but I think a lot of us are not used to being in nature. Um, so, you know, kind of just brushing up on that is, is good, good practice before you go spend time outdoors. Okay, great. And, um, Ben, I know a lot of people are heading on road trips, uh, this, uh, of course, the summer, but I think this trend is going to definitely continue into the fall and even into the winter months um, as people will try to head south a little bit more. So, uh, you know, again, I want to cover stuff that is really trending right now and that people, uh, this, we're going to see a lot of first timers. I don't know what this data looks like for these types of these injuries and stuff this year in national parks um or just in the outdoors in general but i'm guessing that they're up as there's so many you know new first time people so if you were heading out on a road trip um you know what would you what would you just prepare for like would you go and tune up your car um you know would you have your your fire extinguisher with you what should people be thinking about yeah, I mean, if you're going to, especially out west where you have like long empty spaces, you know, um, where, where you're in remote areas, yeah, I'd always pack extra water and extra food just in case of breakdown. Um, you know, an atlas, we, you know, we're, we're all used to using Google Maps, but buy an atlas, they're really fun to look at and um, know how to read it in case, you know, you don't have cell phone service and, and you want to, and it also makes it more fun. You want to check out a different road. Um, being able to navigate is something that I think some of us probably overlook. Um, and um, let me see what else. Yeah, triple A is always helpful. Um, yeah, and, and just have have a plan. Um, it's it's really fun to be spontane uh, spontaneous, but um, campgrounds sell out, hotels sell out. Um, the parks were really be busy this summer, despite everything. Um, so doing a little advanced planning um, and keeping. Uh, a spontaneous attitude, I think, is the right approach. And, you know, we have a lot of really great small towns in America, and that's one of my favorite things about road tripping. But I think it's also important to go into small towns with an open mind, um, try to support local businesses, um, and just kind of adapt to the cultures that you're visiting. Yeah, I, I couldn't echo that loudly enough when you roll into these small towns. Um, people are you know, it's a very, it's a very polarized time. You're coming in without a state license plate. Um, yeah, you just want to be, be careful. And uh, you're going to see different attitudes and different culture with all that's going on. And, uh, but yeah, trying to just adapt to the local norms as best. Um, I would say wear a mask, even if people aren't, I, I ran into that, like, I was the only person wearing a mask in a, you know, little podunk town where COVID probably never ever was And this, like people were wearing spurs on their cowboy boots. I was the only one without a cowboy hat on. And I was like, Oh, I feel kind of silly wearing a mask right now, but I'm still going to do it. I, you know, it's just yeah. the way I, I, I felt. Um, but yeah, adapting is, is really important. And you learn that traveling. Yeah. And I guess that's part of leave no trace right now too. It's, when you're traveling to some of these communities, like you don't want to be spreading 
you know, the virus. So should be really careful and, and still, even if, even if people aren't wearing masks, like you should still do your part so that you're not infecting this community that you're visiting. Exactly. And, and if you're traveling, you probably came from a place where the virus, de there was definitely, you know, if you came from a more populated place, mm -hmm. just the increase, uh, just the probability is much higher. And you don't want to be that person that brought it uh, to a small town or, or something like that where elderly people are still out. And um, yeah, that's, that's for sure. Uh, man, Ben, I've asked you a uh, ton of questions so far. This has been super uh, helpful. We talked a lot about California and um, before we get to our rapid fire question segment, talked a lot about California, but been on the news, wildfires. Uh, we've all seen these uh, photos now of San Francisco, that one particular week where it looked like the apocalypse. Um, is the sky actually falling? How bad are we talking? Uh, yeah, send us an update from yeah. Oakland, would you please? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so things have gotten a lot better. Um, uh, I think one thing to remember is how big California is. So I think with the fires we had this year, I mean, it, it was really terrible. I mean, it still is terrible. Um, and it's, it's a significant amount of acreage, but it's a really large state. So if you're thinking about traveling to California, um, I would just say, you know, call a local operator, call, you know, a local hotel, um, call where you're going to go and, and, and see what the conditions are, because they can really vary. Um, we had really bad smoke in the Sierra Nevada. Um, Yosemite National Park closed for about a week. Um, it's currently much, much better. Air quality is great. Um, we're running tours up there, and people are having a good time. Um, and now we have uh, we've had consistent fires um, in wine country and Sonoma and Napa, and those are still going on right now. Um, so air quality is it's getting a little bit better up there um, in the Bay right now. It it feels totally normal. Um, so fires can be fairly localized, um, but they can you know we had a couple of weeks where it was pretty bad all throughout Northern California, um, which, so I would say, first of all, like, you know, just do your research because you might find out that there's not um, issues with fires. We had a lot of cancellations um, due to fires in on trips that didn't, wouldn't have encountered any bad air quality. Um, but at the same time, it's become a year, an annual thing for us over the last four years. I, and I used to live in Sonoma County, which um, in, in the town of Santa Rosa, um, I have had to, had to evacuate twice in three years due to fires. So it's becoming um, a, 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 not a great situation. Um, and I think it's a good reminder that, um, you know, we should be conscious of climate change when we travel as well. Um, because it's, yeah, it's something that, that will only get worse if we don't get better. You know what I mean? Uh, ab absolutely. And this is an opportunity for people to explore their own backyard all these planes being grounded is definitely helping the situation with climate change. Um, not to get political, Ben, but I will ask you a question you may or may not know the answer. Um, in, the in the first presidential debate uh, here in the United States, Trump was talking about forest management. He almost admitted that climate change was real, which I thought was a really great step in the right direction. Um, but uh, my, my commentary aside, uh, do you know anything about um, uh, forest management? And is this something that we need to be putting more resources into? Um, you know, well, first of all, I, it, it's funny when he says that because most of the forests in California, for instance, are national forests. So it's it's sort of up to him, um, okay. but, but um, and, and I, I don't know enough about forest management. I'm sure there's improvements that they could make. Um, I, I know that a lot of it's because of climate change, but a, another thing is, is just the sort of urban sprawl um, and, and growth in California is, is a major issue. Um, they call it the urban wildland boundary or something like that. It's basically, we, you ha we have a housing crisis in California and, and areas like Sonoma County have just been growing and growing and you know, there's more construction in areas that um, are very wildfire prone. So um, for instance, we had a really bad fire in Santa Rosa in 2017. Um, quite a few people died, over 5,000 houses were destroyed. Um, and they actually showed the 
I saw this thing where they showed the path of the fire and a similar fire uh, many years ago, maybe back in the 1970s, basically followed the same pathway. Um, so it's, it's, you know, wildfires are a natural occurrence, um, but back then there was no houses built in that area. So we're also encroaching on nature more and more and building in areas where um, wildfires are, uh, occur more often, that with climate change and, and possibly forest management, I'm not sure, um, it's just made like the situation a lot more dangerous. Um, yeah. Okay. And, and I, I do want to point out um, to people that some wildfires are necessary, right? Yeah. This is a way that the forest regenerates mm -hmm. itself, but am I correct in thinking that not to this extent? Exactly, yeah. It's, it's gotten much worse. And, 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 and a lot of these fires are started by humans in some way or another. Um, a lot of the major ones in California have been started by uh, power lines, um, things like that. So, um, you know, wildfires do happen by lightning typically, um, you know, throughout history, um, but they have gotten much worse. Um, sure. And, and the droughts that we're experiencing due to climate change have made these places that much more dry and then lightning strikes and then you have this so it wasn't started by humans but it's still probably our fault um, yeah they're starting earlier too and they're much larger yeah and through my travels in the last month other than indoor areas like visitor centers nothing i don't think any area were closed in these national parks due to covid but due to the droughts and that it wasn't even safe to have some hiker go and, and light up a cigarette or you know who knows what and start a fire or get trapped in a fire if one started. Um, yeah, there were some hiking trails and even parts of roads that were closed uh, because of forest fires. So, um, and, and I'll just mention that you can get the smoke anywhere i mean the smoke travels for thousands of miles so even when i was in wyoming they were saying oh yeah it's uh smoggy or maybe that's not the right word but it's it's hazy because of the, fi the fires in california so I, my mom even said it was in new york they were having yeah. uh, smoke so it's just a, just crazy yeah yeah it's, it's a it's a bad situation i hope we can make it better Ab absolutely. Um, well, Ben, before we wrap up, you ready for some rapid fire questions? Yeah, let's do it. All right, Ben, I got to ask you, what is your favorite U.S. national park? Um, that's tough. I mean, I, I'll i reframe the question. If, if you're going to go to one national park before you die, it's Yosemite National Park, Yosemite Valley. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, Yosemite. Now, uh, if you had to visit one state in the United States before you die, where would it be? Alaska. Ooh, okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that is a good one. Ben, what is your favorite small town in America? Hmm. Oh, man, that's a tough one. Um... Just gonna throw it out of that. Occidental California. Okay. Uh, I don't even know how to spell that, but I'm gonna get it from you. <laughs> awesome. Um, ben, what would you say the best hike in all, uh, let's say best day hike in all of the United States is? Um, Angel's Landing in Zion National Park. Ooh, okay. It, that's in our, on our itinerary uh, for under 30 experiences, isn't it? Yeah, I, I believe uh, weather permitting. Is, weather yes. permitting. Okay, of course, like all hikes. Um, all right. What is one piece of camping gear that you could not live without? A good, sleeping not, bag. A good sleeping bag. Do you have a specific uh, sleeping bag that you like? Um, I don't know the model. I have a Marmot, but it's, um, it's a really, like, if you're going to camp in cold weather, that's an investment you should make. Um, awesome. And, and this I've camped, and I think I've, gotten down to 14 degrees Fahrenheit and been warm in the bag. Okay, good. There's a uh, mummy bag, like a down mummy bag that comes up with the hood? Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. I'll try to uh, find an example of a marmot bag. Uh, that's a very good 
brand and link it up in, in the show notes if people want to check it out. And then finally, see which bag I have and let you know too. Okay, yeah, please. That would be great. And then one piece of hiking gear that you cannot hike without. For longer hikes, I, I really like hiking with sticks, walking sticks. Okay. I can used to, but I, I really, now it's part of my, anything over five miles, I like to have walking sticks, especially if I'm carrying a pack. Great. Now, uh, particular hike, adjustable hiking poles yeah. or just sticks that you cut out of the forest? Uh, I mean, if I'm back, if I'm carrying weight um, and I have, I have a really good pair of lightweight ones, but, you know, even just for a short day hike, even just a, a stick out of the forest can be really nice. Great. So, yeah, yeah easy, easy on the knees. Uh, do you have a, a specific brand of hiking poles that you like? Um, I have a pair of Leckies, L-E-K-I. Um, okay, super lightweight. Um, again, I don't know the model, but I've had them for years. It took me up lots of mountains. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Ben, this was a lot of fun. Um, I wanted to uh, let people know where they could reach out to you. And also, if they are in the Bay Area, I know you guys at Incredible Adventures are really trying to encourage people to explore their own backyard. And uh, you guys are an awesome company to do that with and uh, very eco-friendly as well. So it, would you mind telling people where they can, uh, where they can find you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, our website is incadventures.com, I-N-C adventures.com. Um, and that's our Instagram handle as well, Inc. Adventures. Um, we're San Francisco's greenest tour company. We run um, all of our incredible adventures trips with petroleum-free biofuel. Um, and we have great single-day, multi-day trips um, up to Yosemite, Tahoe, um, and the Sierra Nevadas. We also take lots of groups into uh, Muir Woods um, and wine country. Um, and, and we've got some great product in San Francisco as well. So um, yeah, it's kind of like the anything in the Bay Area, we love taking people around. Um, and right now we're even doing local discounts too. So if you're in the Bay Area, um, look at our website and give us a call. Great, and if people wanna get a hold of you personally, uh, would, you, would you ask people to reach out to you on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, email, what's best for people who yes, are, are, uh, wanna contact have, Ben? I'm not too active on social media, but uh, you can email. Um, it's ben at inkadventures.com. Um, and then I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, Great. I think if you my Instagram, you'd probably be uh, disappointed <laughs> with the amount of photos I have. <laughs> hey, as a good outdoors person, you are, uh, you are out there in the wild and yeah. uh, <laughs> trying to disconnect. So that's, that's great. Well, Ben, uh, we're definitely going to have to have you on again. You have, um, yeah, you've been awesome to talk to for this yeah, past awesome. hour. And thanks for being on. Yeah, thanks a lot, Matt. Take You're care. very welcome.